Thank you, Julie. Uh, good uh, afternoon and good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. Uh, just going to spend a little bit of time this morning uh, for me, I'm still in the central time zone, uh, reviewing the Dixil Universal XR replacement controller, primarily for reaching applications. Um, we have had uh, very good success uh, with wholesalers uh, adopting this product. It's been out for a while. Many of you already had it uh, uh, through Weiss, but we've had uh, a very good amount of success getting that uh, going through our channel from the time we brought it in. And what I wanted to do is just try to help with some familiarity. Uh, I know the more times you, you hear this stuff and the more times you get comfortable with it, the, the easier it will be to sell it to the customers and support the contractors. So. Just as a review, uh, the universal controller uh, is designed to take the place of about 80% of the reaching controls that Dixell has manufactured uh, for those applications. Um, and they've, they've uh, very geniusly, uh, by the engineers that set up the, the American version, this actually, this version is really only sold in the US. Uh, it was set up by the engineers uh, that were working uh, for Weiss and basically Dixell uh, set it up to where it can be configured. It's already built in with seven different programs inside this one controller. All the contractor has to do is uh, take a look at the piece of equipment, figure out the type of uh, the temperature application it is, the type of uh, defrost it has, the type of defrost termination, and it's already got everything all built in there. He just has to pick one of the seven basic configurations and set it up. Um, and so that's one of the things that's really great about it. But be even though it can handle all of those different applications, uh, there is a lot of power and a lot of flexibility it has. It's really pretty easy to, and, and intuitive to set up. Um, and, and really, you know, so look at some of these bullet points on the right here in terms of the key features. Uh, there's, you know, you can, you can configure the probe types because there, there was an industry change that happened years ago where they, everybody used to use positive temperature coefficient sensors, which means that as the temperature sense increases, the resistance increases, and then everybody switched to negative temperature. But if you happen to have a piece of appliance out there that is really old, uh, you, you might want to be able to uh, utilize that old PTC type. And that, and that really is, of course, only if uh, the wiring is such that it's just really uh, a pain to get it out there. Uh, we always would recommend the controller comes with, with two temperature sensors. We always recommend that you use those two new temperature sensors to eliminate any problems of wiring shorts or, or uh, you know, moisture has gotten in those or any of those things might, might uh, cause. But um, if, if that just feasibly can't be done, it's very easy to change the type of sensors that the controller is looking at. Uh, once the program has been set up, if there's going to be, you know, if, if a particular contractor does a lot of these and wants to go and make some configuration changes, he has the ability to back up that program to, uh, you know, to the, uh, the same kind of hotkey we've been using on all the Dixel controllers and then be able to easily download and replicate that uh, multiple times, so even save the, uh, the types of the programming sequence he'd have to go through that first time. And then, of course, we always want to point out that this controller, as well as all the Dixel controls we sell, are uh, capable of being uh, networked in to our XWeb and our monitoring system. So it's not just strictly a standalone control. Uh, get into a little bit more detail of the features here. So uh, one of the primary things that has to be done in the setup, and really the only major thing that has to be done in the setup is just to tell the controller what basic type of control it is. Uh, that is, uh, we had to set the TC parameter. And basically, it could be uh, uh, a warmer, uh, basically a warmer oven for a so heating operation. Uh, and then you've got several uh, uh, controllers, uh, two through uh, four are basically uh, medium temp applications in terms of uh, they're all going to have off cycle for defrost. And then are we just going to terminate the defrost cycle uh, by either elapsed time or are we going to terminate it by temperature? And then there's some other options added in there for like uh, if, if there's going to be an alarm relay. Uh, programs five and six are both for low temp applications. So you've basically got the ability to bring in electric or hot gas defrost and we're going to terminate it off time. And then number six is kind of the most complex one or the, the, most, the most features that it supports it has also thrown in a fan control on that. 
if you had a medium temp application and you did want fan control, you could still pick number six, um, and just you're just going to increase the set point up to uh, you know the temperature you're going to be operating at. There's no reason you can't use temperature control six in a medium temp application. And then seven hey, Mike, on the bottom. Um, yes, we do have a question that came in from Tom Reese. Do you happen to know what the hotkey part number is? I do, if, and okay. I have a uh, – right near the end of the presentation, there's a slide okay. with a couple of accessories, so we have that. Perfect. Um, Perfect. Thanks. Temperature Control 7 is an open map configuration. It's basically uh, a generic, um, uh, not quite – PLC level, but you can you can open you can, you can tie different relays into different sensors, and it's completely free programmed. Uh, I mean, it's it's there. I'm not sure it's going to be something that's going to be used very often, but you know, just in case you wanted to, it it, it could be there. Um, kind of. So the next step on that is also kind of tied into. So these are the same settings one through seven, and basically it's just telling you uh, what how many probes are available with each configuration. Um, so obviously, control type number two is one of the ones that has uh, time termination of defrost, so you would not be hooking up the evaporator probe on there. But you've got your room probe uh, or your, your, your case probe that's going to be mounted down in your case. That's going to be uh, the, the sensor used for the regulation of the compressor. And then your, your other probe mounted on your evaporator is going to be there for terminating your, uh, your defrost. Um, and then they all have the ability for a digital input. Probe 3 basically is your, your, um, your door switch contact. So those are the ones that are available. Again, every one of the three modules that we sell, we sell it in a 24-volt, a 120-volt, which is the most popular, and then a 230-volt. All three of those each come with, uh, with two temperature probes in every box. Uh, I have a couple of wiring diagrams just kind of showing um, a little bit of the, the basic appliance, the kind of the basic configuration options that you have. Uh, so one of the things to kind of point out here is that, so if you look over on the left on digital input, uh, you know, by default it's set up as a door switch, but if you wanted to get into and change the functionality of that, uh, of that digital input, you could change it to any one of those seven different uh, seven different um, uh, inputs in terms of you wanted to inst instead make, turn it into an energy savings uh, function instead of a door switch. So you've got the ability to get it into the parameters and make those adjustments. I want to draw your attention on the lower left to the wiring diagram and point out that, I get my cursor going there, point out that you power the controller on terminals four and five there. So that's where you bring your line voltage power. In this case, it's a 120 volt controller. Um, and then you, uh, the switches for controlling, and this, this TC1 is a heater only, so it is going to control whenever it, it gets too cool in the, in the reach-in, it needs to increase the temperature, it's going to close terminal 1 to terminal 3 with that switch. Uh, the point I wanted to make here is that uh, you do need to bring over uh, the power that you're going to be controlling that heater with uh, into terminal 1, an internal controller will pass it over to terminal three whenever that switch makes. Same thing on the uh, on the uh, other coin types, which we'll go to next. But the purpose for having that is, in some instances, you would want uh, to have a different voltage powering the controller versus the voltage that is actually powering your devices, such as the case if it was a 24 volt module. Uh, there were a number of Asian companies that were bringing over controllers that were uh, all 24 volts, so they didn't have to be uh, certified by UL a number of years ago. Um, and when you do that, uh, most, since most of the compressors and other things you're turning on are line voltage, you wanted to have a separation within the controller of the voltage powering the controller versus the voltage you're switching. So that's basically the, the rationale of why that's set up. Uh, let's skip ahead to terminals, uh, the, the control type 6. There's no reason in kind of going over every single one, but just wanted to show that this is the control type that does have the fan command. Uh, it has basically all the bells and whistles, if you will. So we're still powering on terminals four and five, uh, and then we're jumping over to terminal number one to provide power to control the fan and the compressor. They both have to be running at the same voltage because they have a common power input. Um, you have a five amp contact on your fan and eight amp contact on the compressor. And then over here uh, for the defrost, uh, you actually can 
if you for some reason wanted to be using different voltage, use different voltage for that because you also have to bring power over to terminal six. And then all of the temperature inputs, um, so those are all spake connectors on the back of the controller. And the temperature inputs are all uh, the screw terminals on the top row. Uh, so you've got a common uh, terminal 11 that goes out to and then comes back through the, the, the one wire on terminal 12, one wire on terminal 10. So your room probe is going into 12. Your evap termination, uh, defrost termination comes into terminal 10. And then your digital input comes, comes into terminal uh, 9. So terminal 11 would need to be the outcoming DC power trickle voltage that would have to be on one, one half of the sensor for both the temperature sensors. So basically, you just put both wires under that same number 11 screw. You'd also have to get that over to, to your, your, wall, uh, to your um, door switch. So that's the basic wine that we have for that. If we skip right over here to, uh, this is basically just reinforcing, it's a standard refrigeration temperature control. So uh, you're going to uh, set your set point. Uh, it already has a default uh, dead band in there. That's a, basically a hysteresis or a, or a differential that is the number of degrees above that set point that the temperature has to rise to before we energize and turn on the compressor. And it's going to stay energized until we get down to our set point and at which point it will shut off. So that's what the graph on the left is showing us. Uh, if we take a look at that, it's just showing when the compressor is on and when the compressor is off. Uh, it will stay off until the temperature rises back to the set point plus that hysteresis differential, then turn back on and stay on again until we get back to the set point. So your set point is your cutout point, which is what we're using in refrigeration all the time. There are some pretty advanced features that, and, so, and, and basically that's all the guy would uh, basically have to know when we're setting it up. Uh, there are some, uh, some very advanced features that if they wanted to take advantage of, they can. Um, uh, on terminal controls type six, which is the one that has active fan control, it defaults to the fans are running anytime uh, the compressor, anytime you're in temperature regulation. So the fans will run whether the compressor is on or they're off. Uh, that's basically the second bullet point down here. Uh, and they will not run during frost. That is the default setting. But if you wanted any other combination, if you wanted the fan to cycle, uh, and if you wanted the fan to be off during the frost, you have the ability of setting one of those other three. Um, draw your attention to the bottom bullet point uh, on the left. And that is the, uh, what do I want, that, that's a fan stop temperature. This is basically built in there so that we do not circulate hot air uh, through the box. We're, allow, we're going to allow ourselves a amount of temperature to pre-cool the evaporator before we allow the fan to start circulating. And that's, that's what that is. I draw attention to that because uh, if someone is unaware of that, uh, you know, it might generate a phone call into you know, our Copeland technical specialists, our specialists at our, at our wholesalers because uh, they looked at it and, and they set everything up. They thought they did everything right. They turned it all on. The compressor came on, but the fan did not start blowing, even though uh, the type of fan command it was supposed to blow on while the compressor is running. So it's not running, so what gives? It's basically just in there to allow the temperature of that evaporator to cool down. The default value is 46 degrees. Once it gets below 46, the fan turns on and continues to circulate. It's just smart. We just don't want to be circulating that hot air through the box. There is a couple of other uh, things that are built into there, one of which is a fast freezing mode. Uh, essentially, um, if I am putting a lot of hot product into uh, my reach-in, such as a whole bunch of brand new sodas, maybe the, the, maybe the, uh, the appliance has been off for uh, a, a period of time. Uh, when I put that in there, instead of, and I want to lower the set point to make sure that I cool the product thoroughly so I not only am I you know, cooling down the outside of the cans and, you know, a couple of fractions of an inch of that, of, of that volume of that liquid. I want to make sure that I thoroughly chill the whole thing, uh, basically set up a, um, a, uh, a, a, a chill down mode, if you will. It's set up, and we call it continuous cycle. Um, there is the button on the right hand side of the controller. All you have to do is press the icon uh, for three seconds. Um, um, you want to press uh, that button as long as you don't have the frost going on until that icon lights up. And then you're going to, um, for the amount of seconds or for the amount of minutes that have been set up, and now it defaults to zero, so you can't 
or you don't have to worry about somebody coming along and just starting to push buttons and, and lowering the temperature of all of your drinks uh, after you've already got them maintained to, to, uh, to 35 degrees. You don't want to take them down below that and risk freezing them. So it's defaulted to zero, but uh, if you want to change that to a number of minutes and you change the uh, amount of the temperature setting, so this is minus five. So whatever temperature set point I'm controlling my compressor to, whenever this uh, fast freezing mode goes into effect, it will lower my actual temperature, it'll lower my temperature setting for uh, my control point by that amount. So in this case, it would lower it by five degrees, and it's going to Main, try to maintain that set point. It's going to try to chill to that value. Uh, say instead of 35 degrees, let's say it was 30 degrees. Try to chill to that value for the number of minutes that I have set up. And maybe I put it for 30 minutes or I put it for 45 minutes. Uh, just kind of whatever that value might want to be. But again, by default, those are set to zero. There is an energy saving mode. Basically, it's, it, it's again, it's a secondary cooling set point that you can have. Activated by pressing the, uh, basically the, the day-night button. Um, so think of that as like occupied, unoccupied, if you will. Uh, or you could actually activate it by a digital input. Uh, so that would be uh, that, where I show you on the diagram, the different options you had under the, the, uh, the digital input. It's default as a door switch, but you could change it if you wanted to, or you could activate it by the button. But it, it has a, and again, it's default setting to zero, so you don't have to worry about somebody coming by and saying, hey, what's that? That's kind of cool. Let's push this button and see what happens. Uh, they could push it all they want. If you have it set to zero, there's no change going to happen. But if you wanted to take advantage of, let's say you had an application that maybe this was on a, uh, instead of on a reach-in application, maybe it was on uh, like a buffet line type of a, type of a uh, cold plate where they, you know, the cafeteria, they're going to set out all the little dishes of jello and pudding. And uh, they wanted to have the ability to not, they don't want to completely shut it off when they finish serving. Uh, let's say it is like at a school cafeteria and you've got breakfast and you've got, uh, you've got lunch, you've got two serving times and there's a period in between where uh, maybe they don't want to just maintain it at the same temperature. They want to allow it to increase you know, 10 degrees or so and then bring it back down uh, because they're very, maybe possibly they're very energy conscious. Well, that's very easily done by uh, setting up the, uh, the energy saving mode. Uh, just add it as a, as a uh, plus 10 degrees um, and then uh, set it up to where you have a time clock or other device that is activating that input and it will bump it by 10 degrees for the amount of time you have and then let it go right back down to the temperature you know, before, the, before they start putting everything out for lunch. That's just kind of one kind of example of what can be done to again defaulted to zero. Some other features that the controller has, it's very handy that it has uh, temperature probe calibration, which is always good because uh, if you've got a temperature that's a, you know, a couple of degrees off, uh, it's very it's, it's much simpler to just go ahead and calibrate that in terms of replacing that temperature probe. Um, in case you do have a faulty probe, though, uh, there is the nice feature built in that is basically is a faulty probe run cycle or a lump along mode uh, by default. Uh, if so, in case that the temperature sensor gets, uh, gets cut in half or whatever happens, and it, and it sees that uh, it basically has infinite resistance, or if it sees it as a short, it knows that it's not running, it will automatically go into a mode where it will turn the compressor off for 15 minutes and then turn it off for 30 minutes and just repeat that cycle over and over and over until that temperature temperature uh, probe has been fixed. Of course, it's going to generate an alarm. It'll be flashing P1 for, you know, P1 probe failure and that kind of stuff. But it might take a period of time from you know, that time that happens and somebody notices it and it just may, helps you maintain the temperature of the product that's in there without just completely letting it ruin. Things like, you know, if this was an ice cream freezer, you wouldn't want it just completely shutting off just because you had a temperature failure, uh, a temperature probe failure. Another thing that is, is nice is that if uh, to eliminate service calls, maybe you want to create a delay after you come out of defrost. Uh, it's defaulted to zero. So basically when it's in the defrost mode, uh, the display is defaulted to read DEF for defrost. But then after that, uh, what temperature will it be in the box? And so if it just so happens that right when it comes out of defrost, somebody walks by and they see the temperature is, is a lot warmer than they know it usually says on there, uh, that might generate a phone call. So having the ability to change that value, it's change the amount of time that it takes before it starts 
going back and displaying the room temperature or the probe one temperature might be nice to adjust that up to 15 minutes or 20 minutes or something uh, just to eliminate some phone calls. Uh, there's door open alarm. Uh, you also have the ability to have alarm really output. Um, and then just some other things that we mentioned, like uh, one of the nice things is the two levels of programming. A lot of the features I've been talking about um, are in that second level of programming, so you want to make sure that they're not adjusted and, and, and manipulated by kind of novice people that are kind of bumping along on there. You've got to really want, you've got to want to get into that second level to go in and adjust you know, some of these more advanced features. Uh, just a quick review here. This is the face of what the controller looks like. And again, so, um, you know, you've got your normal up-down buttons and set, just like we've always seen on the electronic unit controllers on our Copeland condensed units. Uh, the diff one of the differences is that on the, on the left-hand side in the center, you've got your defrost. You push that to start your manual defrost if you want to do that. There is no defrost termination by pushing it again. Once it starts to frost, it's going to continue that defrost cycle unless, of course, you decide that I don't want that to happen, in which case you'd have to kill the power to the controller and turn it back on. And, of course, the energy saving button on the lower right that I talked about, the day-night button. Okay. Uh, so how the contractor actually goes about setting this up. It's, it's pretty simple, but these, these, uh, these next couple slides deal with actually the commission of the controller. Obviously, first thing to do is when he's replacing the controller, compare it to the, you know, compare it to the existing controller he's taken out in terms of what wires go where. They should be in the same, they should be in the same locations, but ideally he's, he's smart enough to realize, okay, I've got this one's going to a compressor, this one's going to defrost. Wire it up. Uh, just like the, if it was replacing a Dixel controller, it wires it up just like the one he pulled out. And if, if he was replacing a Danfoss or a Corel or something else, take a look at the wiring diagram on the controller, wire everything up, uh, and then once he powers the controller up, he is going to uh, basically, once it, once it powers up, the first thing to do is you just press the down button, which is step number one up here at the top, and that will uh, then go through uh, that quick scan to determine so it's, what it's saying here, TPD, is it's it's the type of probe is being determined. And then it will select for itself uh, NTC or PTC. Again, do I want the resistance going down or do I want the resistance going up? Oh, quick thing. Let me go back once. Uh, now this is coming up on the next slide. Sorry. Uh, here we go. And set the control type. Uh, there is In the presentation, there's actually a link to a video that we have, and Julie is going to be sharing that YouTube video with you. But we've got a YouTube video out there that uh, shows a, a, basically a technician going through and, and doing this. It's, it's really pretty simple, but you know, the more things that can help reinforce uh, you know, the, the, um, the sim getting this information out there, the better. So we do have a YouTube video for it. But basically, um, what you do is you press at any time, at any time you press the upper left button, which is uh, the lock with a TC on it. That is type of control. Once you press that down, hold it for three seconds, it's going to uh, display the TC parameter. You just use the up and down buttons to scroll between one and seven for, uh, you press set to say, okay, I want to set that, I want to change it. Scroll, scroll up and down between one and seven, find the parameter that you want, and the type that you want that matches the wiring diagram, it matches the uh, defrost, the fan control, those kind of things, and then press you, that you set it. Now, it's very important to remember, this has to be done before you do any other changes, like if they wanted to uh, change what happens to the fan while it is in, um, while, is, while the compressor is running or what's in the defrost, or they wanted to add in the energy saving, any of those kind of things all get reset back to their default values whenever you change the type of controller. So this is absolutely has to be the first thing that's done. And then after that, you can go in and then you basically you're just setting your set point. And uh, once you set that, the controller will then start controlling. So I went through, hey, this thing is a lot powerful, it's flexible, you can do all these kind of things with it. But realistically, the only thing that has to be done is um, uh, if you wanted to uh, have verified the types of control, uh, the types of sensors that are on there, if you actually install the new sensors as you should, they're defaulted to NTC, which is what the controller is. You don't even have to do this step. The really, the only thing you got to do is tell this controller what type of control it's going to follow: uh, medium temp, low temp, uh, and, 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 and the type of termination of the of the defrost. And then once that's done, you set the set point. Once that's done. Boom, the controller off and it goes and it's, and it's, it's regulating and it's controlling everything. 
This is a snapshot of the instruction sheet that is in uh, the package itself, a little QR code that will take you to a website for the Universal Controller. Uh, there, uh, once you get there, there's a number of things that are available, including links to, uh, to uh, some articles, a uh, basic uh, overview of the controller itself. And here are the accessories. Uh, if they wanted to, uh, and, and, and they, I have the hotkey on there, it's not actually the part number. We'll have to, well, you'll have to get that from your salesperson. What I wanted to point out by putting this um, page on the presentation was in some, you know, you can actually use this controller in something other than a region. Uh, I have some people that have actually wanted to use it in a, in a walk-in, in which case uh, we have this uh, electrical box that is already uh, pre-cut with the profile of the controller itself, that with the, over here on the left, the C box. You can actually mount the controller in there, do all the wiring inside of that, and have it nice look mounted on a wall instead of having to try to make some kind of bracket on your own. So that is out there. Uh, the hotkey is available, and of course, if you wanted to tie it into the XWeb, uh, you have to tie, uh, tie it in with one of these adapters. That does not come uh, in the box, but that's something that can be ordered as an accessory. Um, the, uh, the, the, all of the things on this page, the C-Box and, and the adapter and those things are actually ordered by ordering them through Retail Solutions. Okay, a couple more slides, and this is just where you can, can you go to get some more information. Um, we have a page set up on our uh, Story Slab application. Uh, that when you look at the icon on your, on your, uh, your tablet, it will say Climate Sync. Uh, when you go into there, you just go on, on the right-hand side, select Controls. Up will pop this uh, thing on the left. It'll say basically Dixell, and then when I click on that, what pops up then is this set of pages, and I can take a look at some marketing information, instruction sheets, so the full manual for that uh, universal controller with the whole the whole 17 page deal that explains every parameter is here uh, on, on a story slab under universal full manual and as, as well as some brochures. I wanted to point this out as well, the self-paced learning. Uh, so Emerson, uh, we decided to, in the last couple of weeks, uh, make for the rest of the year all of the self-paced learning modules through educational services at no charge. There is a very good module on this, uh, on this controller uh, that can uh, be used by you know, anybody, wholesaler personnel, contractor personnel, whoever wants to get it. We, you know, we highly encourage you guys to take advantage of it. I'm just going to show you how to navigate there if you haven't done that so far. So uh, you go to you know, emersonclimate.com, uh, basically our one Emerson site. You hover over training and support, and the drop-down menu will come. You select uh, HVACR training. Once you've done that, it will take you to this page, and, we, and, and when you will be selecting self-paced uh, training courses. Once I click on that, I will then see a page that looks similar to this. Uh, there are some learning plans that have been set up for like Copeland Compression, uh, Emerson Electronics and Solutions is basically our CPC product. Click on Dixcel, and it will take me to the page with all the Dixcel modules. There's actually a number of those, and the Universal XR controller is the one I'm going to click on. Once, the, uh, once you've gone through the training module, really self-paced, narrated, followed up by a quiz at the end, once you've done that, uh, you take the quiz and you get a nice little certificate saying that you know, this was awarded to you and then the name that you used when you registered. Um, I did get 10 out of 10. I will not confirm or deny whether it took me one turn or four, but I did eventually pass it and got the, uh, the certificate. So you know, it's something nice that, you know, that uh, you know, guys can have out there, and it makes the learning of the controller uh, maybe a little, bit, a little bit better, maybe a little bit more lasting. So that's it. And again, it's something that you know, we, are very, we are very pleased and thankful for the amount of business we've got on this. It's been, it's been very successful for us. And the next step is to help you get it moved off your shelves and into the contractor's hands. And the more information we can provide in their hands, the fewer phone calls will come back to you, and everybody likes that. So do we have any questions, uh, Julie? Um, thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. Uh, I know that was a lot to cover in a short amount of time, and I uh, appreciate you doing that. Also glad that we have this recorded so that if uh, anybody needs to come back and reference it, it's out there. Um, Felicia Hankins just replied that the hotkey kit number is uh, for Tom Reese, that, and for anyone else, that kit number is 943-0039-00. So uh, that's the kit right, great. Um, for X-Line units. That's what which Felicia al Which is. also means that it's in stock at, at Mount Comfort and not just only the retail yes. solutions. So that's, okay. Yep, correct. So, um, Felicia, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. I don't know if you have anything else to add on that. Um, if not, um, we'll just 
we'll just call it a day. And um, I would like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I'll be sending out this uh, recorded presentation and the resources that Mike mentioned. And uh, I'm not entirely sure what the topic will be tomorrow. Um, we were going to cover some portal updates, but I'm not sure that we'll be prepared to do that just yet. And I will tell you that in the coming days, we will have a presentation on uh, the, the product selection software. Um, Brian Binacek, who presented a couple of weeks ago on Boxload Calculator, is going to come back and present on product selection software. So um, if anyone has any suggestions, recommendations for either these sessions where we're covering a, a topic at 15, 20, 30 minutes, or on the longer training sessions, um, please send that feedback to me and we'll try to incorporate it. All right. Everybody have a great day and a great week and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Take care.